For years, I've grappled with the idea of sharing this story, but the weight of its emotional toll has always held me back. Even now, as I sit down to write it, the chilling memories flood back, haunting me as vividly as they did in 2007. At that time, I was 25, and my sister was 23. We lived in the heart of Phoenix, leading lives teetering on the edge of recklessness and adventure. Our days were filled with wild parties and carefree moments, or so it seemed. I was the one who couldn't hold my liquor, a blackout drunk. But on April 20th, my life took a sobering turn, marking 15 years without a drop of alcohol. It was a night etched in terror. We were out with friends, drowning ourselves in the chaos of a late-night party. That night, I was particularly foolish, blinded by my own audacity. I swiped my friend's car keys, driven by the irrational impulse to pick up a couple we had met earlier, hailing from some distant corner of Eastern Europe. I was beyond wasted, beyond reckless. While I was away on this drunken escapade, my sister, equally intoxicated, an unusual sight for her, called me in distress. A friend had discovered my ill-fated decision to abscond with her car. The party erupted in fury when I returned, and I was swiftly, rightfully, cast out into the night. My sister, tears streaming down her face, was mortified. As we stumbled through the darkened streets, searching for a taxi or some semblance of salvation, everything blurred into a hazy nightmare. The next memory I have is of being confined in the back seat of a car, parked at a desolate gas station on Grand Avenue, a road that veered off into an eerie, forgotten Arizona interstate highway. The Eastern European couple, the same ones I had failed to collect earlier, were with us, desperately trying to wrench the car doors open. They, too, must have sensed the impending danger that loomed over us that fateful night. Their eyes betrayed frantic urgency, their voices an insistent plea, as if their sole purpose was to rescue us from the clutches of the man behind the wheel. I have no recollection of who this man was, how we ended up in his car, or where he intended to take us. Why did he need to fill his tank in the dead of night, in that forsaken gas station? The details are shrouded in darkness, lost to the abyss of my memory. Sometimes, when I reflect on that night, I can't help but wonder if the enigmatic couple were guardian angels, sent to shield us from an unspeakable horror. The next day, my sister and I discovered that our phones were gone, stolen, I'm certain, by that sinister man. There's a myriad of nightmarish scenarios that could have unfolded, leaving us with a fate far more terrifying than the one we endured. The guilt gnaws at me, knowing that I put my younger sister through such a harrowing ordeal. And whenever the temptation of alcohol beckons, I replay that haunting memory, reminding myself of the perilous path from which I've managed to escape. As a seasoned outdoors enthusiast, I often took the kids I cared for on various adventures. Recently, one of the children had developed a keen interest in hiking. Eager to nurture this newfound fascination, I decided to take him to a secluded trail in Salt Fork State Park, known for its serene beauty. Our destination was the enigmatic Hozak's Cave, a half-mile hike from the trailhead. This trail had been my choice due to its popularity and the reassurance of encountering other hikers. However, my sense of security was soon shattered. The previous summer, violent storms had ravaged the area, leaving the trail in a state of disrepair. To my astonishment, it was now an arduous and eerily deserted path. The absence of fellow hikers did little to unsettle me initially, as I noticed a small construction crew working on a nearby bridge. Undeterred by the challenging conditions, my young companion remained enthusiastic about the hike. We reached a platform with a breathtaking view of Hozak's cave. Although the platform was off-limits, 
we decided to defy the rules and venture into the cave itself. This area proved to be the most treacherous, and we spent an unsettling amount of time there. Beneath the platform, gnarled tree roots served as a precarious descent, leading us to the heart of Hozak's cave. This place, more like an ominous cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a sinister, trickling waterfall, exuded an unsettling beauty. While exploring the cave, my senses heightened as I noticed an unlit candle perched ominously on a massive rock, its surface marred by a crudely carved heart. A hint of foreboding brushed past my thoughts, but I dismissed it as the remnants of a romantic rendezvous. Ascending to the cave's apex, I stumbled upon two more candles and three haphazardly stacked piles of small rocks, evidently left by another presence. An uneasy feeling settled upon me, but my companion's discovery of a puddle teeming with baby salamanders momentarily distracted me. His sheer delight compelled me to continue our adventure, despite the growing unease. After an hour spent chasing salamanders, we reluctantly decided to leave. It was then that we spotted a damp washcloth hanging mysteriously among the tree roots at the center of the platform. Its sudden appearance was a chilling revelation. Though my young companion noticed the washcloth, he couldn't grasp the gravity of the situation. The reality slowly dawned on me, someone had been observing us without our knowledge, potentially lurking in the shadowy woods, leaving these unsettling objects behind to taunt us. Panicking was not an option, especially with the child by my side. I instructed him to walk ahead of me, offering words of encouragement that inadvertently quickened his pace. During our journey along the narrow, disheveled trail, I never caught sight of anyone else. It was as if our hidden observer had vanished into thin air. As we finally reached our car, I locked the doors with a trembling hand. As we pulled away from the park, my heart lurched. A disheveled man, perhaps in his thirties, emerged from the woods, his dirt-caked visage devoid of expression. His lifeless eyes bore into mine, tracking our movements until he was swallowed by the darkness of the forest. This unsettling encounter confirmed three chilling facts, first, we had been watched, second, our observer had hidden nearby, and third, his malevolent gaze was deliberate, a terrifying attempt to instill fear. In the days that followed, the memory of that stare haunted my every thought, plunging me into severe anxiety. I even contemplated seeking counseling to overcome the profound disturbance it had caused. Though I tried to convince myself that the stranger's presence was mere coincidence, my gut told me otherwise. My young companion remained blissfully unaware of the fear that had gripped me that day. To him, our adventure in the wilderness remained one of the most joyful experiences of his life. He often reminisced about our time together, but for me, it was an ordeal that left me sickened and deeply disturbed. Car trouble was the worst, especially when life's daily struggles already weighed heavy on your shoulders. Whether you were late for work or heading to a first date, a broken-down car could feel like the final straw, pushing you closer to the edge. For me, this was one of many reasons I'd made the switch from buying cars to leasing them. The allure of low maintenance and the security of swapping out vehicles every few years were too enticing to resist. The tale I'm about to recount unfolded four years ago, a story that still haunts my thoughts. It all began innocuously enough when I brought my SUV in for routine maintenance. The mechanic informed me about a recall that needed attention. I thought nothing of it, after all, recalls usually didn't cost anything extra. Hours passed as I sat in the waiting room, and finally, they handed me back the keys, assuring me they'd fixed the recall issue. I headed home, eager to put the day behind me. But as I merged onto the highway, the check engine light blinked to life, 
and my car refused to accelerate beyond 40 miles per hour. Frustration mounting, I made a U-turn and returned to the shop. They explained that something under the hood related to the recall had become detached and promptly offered to fix it. Annoyed yet relieved it seemed an easy fix, I waited. Fast forward four days, and the same nightmare unfolded. The check engine light taunted me once more, and my car's power dwindled. This time, I called the shop immediately. However, they tried to brush me off, insisting I needed an appointment. I voiced my exasperation, reminding them that my car had been running perfectly until their intervention with the so-called recall. Back at the shop, I was met by Jerry, a tall, bearded mechanic with a disconcerting grin and a few missing teeth. He apologized for the inconvenience, explaining I needed to fill out some paperwork for the recall. Weary and irritated, I complied, providing my contact information without much thought. Jerry assured me it would be a quick fix. As I left with my repaired car, I couldn't shake Jerry's strange, toothy smile. Something about him left me uneasy. A week passed, and I couldn't shake the feeling of dread every time I stepped into my car. It was a particularly grueling week at work and I looked forward to a quiet evening at home. During a movie halfway through the night, an unknown number flashed on my phone screen. I answered, only to be met with silence, except for faint, unsettling sounds, whispers, or perhaps breaths. Annoyed, I hung up, returning to the movie. Minutes later, the same number called again. This time, the breathing was more pronounced. Can I help you? I asked, but there was no response. I hung up and blocked the number. Later, I dozed off on the couch. I awoke to a sudden, blinding flash outside my window, initially mistaking it for lightning or a malfunctioning TV. But the TV was off. Panic gripped me as I realized the light emanated from outside. Rushing to the window, I witnessed a nightmarish scene, a figure fleeing from the side of my house toward a red, rusted car adorned with Sunoco gas stickers. Desperate for more information, I raced to my front door, hoping for a glimpse of the license plate or something more identifying. Yet, all I saw was that same red car. I called the police, reporting the incident, though I knew there was little they could do. Still. I wanted it on record. As days passed, the unease lingered, exacerbated by the ever-present fear of my car breaking down yet again. One fateful morning, the car issue recurred for the third time, sending me into a rage. I stormed into the auto shop, demanding a permanent fix or a new vehicle. The manager assured me that they would secure the recall to ensure it wouldn't happen again. After a brief wait, they returned my car, once again apologizing. It was then that I saw it, the red car with the Sunoco gas stickers, parked nearby. My heart raced as I recognized Jerry, the mechanic, getting into it. I hastily left, trying to shake off my anxiety. At home, I decided to call the police once more, reporting the sighting. However, they offered little reassurance, leaving me with more questions than answers. The calls and strange encounters ceased, and life gradually returned to normal. I now drive a different vehicle and make sure to have it serviced at a completely different auto shop. Yet, the chilling mystery of that recall and the enigmatic Jerry still haunts me, a story I can never fully put behind me.